I'm Dr. Jim Woodburn. Uh, I'm the Chief Orbital Scientist at Analytical Graphics, and today I'm going to be talking to you about multi-satellite orbit determination. Oops, wrong thing. Okay, so there's a number of reasons why you might want to do multi-satellite orbit determination. And what I mean by multi-satellite orbit determination is when we process measurements on multiple satellites simultaneously in the same estimator. Now, there, the advantages of doing this uh, typically are associated with things like estimating common biases between the multiple spacecraft. Uh, those common biases can be in the ground system. Um, they can be uh, related to atmospheric effects and such things. Um, you also are often want to do multi-satellite orbit determination if you're flying a formation of satellites. So multiple satellites flying cooperatively. Um, and in all of these cases, um, there are the, the big benefit comes from um, estimating, as I mentioned previously, either common unknowns um, up here, which are things like the, the biases that I, I mentioned, uh, or relative states between the spacecraft. This is common if you're looking at a formation of spacecraft or a cluster of geostationary spacecraft, for example. And then typically, if you're interested in the relative uh, states of the spacecraft, you're also interested in relative state uncertainty. And if you look at the um, variety of different applications that I have uh, on the chart here, you can see that many of them actually are, are most interested in the uh, uncertainty. So uh, for proximity operations, obviously, we're interested in how close things are where they are relative to each other, but we are also concerned about um, bumping into each other, um, as well as making sure that our formation is um, it, such that the spacecraft are where they need to be to satisfy their mission. Um, also down here at the bottom, you see this uh, particular example of um, computing conjunction probability, and, or probability of coll a collision during a conjunction. And this computation is extremely sensitive to having proper uncertainty between the two objects. So we're very, very interested in the relative uncertainty there. Now, whenever we're doing um, multiple satellites at one time, we always have the, the possibility, right, that, that we're, we're observing them simultaneously. And there's a couple of different ways we can observe satellites simultaneously. One is through direct satellite-to-satellite -satellite observation, right, where both satellites are actually involved in the observation, one typically taking the observation of the other, but involving the observation itself, involving the states of both satellites. Another possibility is that the satellites are within the same field of view of a particular instrument. And we see this a lot of the time with um, geostationary satellites, for example, that are flying in a cluster, which may be uh, in the same field of view of an optical instrument that's being used to track those, those satellites. And in this case, uh, we have a special circumstance that can become useful for um, uh, a particular problem in space situational awareness called observation association, where that problem is the one of saying, okay, I took a, a measurement of a particular satellite, now let me associate that measurement with the satellite of interest. Right. In this particular example here, I have three satellites in field of view of my simulated optical instrument. Um, the orbit uncertainty associated with any one of these satellites may make it such that I could associate an observation of one satellite with one of the others that's also in the field of view. Um, a technology that helps that, however, is if my sensor is able to take relative measurements in addition to absolute. So by absolute measurements, I mean a measurement of a satellite, typically with an optical sensor, would be a right ascension and declination measurement. So where is the satellite relative to the star background? Um, in this case, however, what I might want to do is I might want to take an absolute measurement of one of the satellites and take relative measurements of the other two to say that this, this satellite, for example, is uh, higher in declination than this satellite. Um, in that way, uh, I, can, I, may n I, I may not be able to uniquely identify an absolute measurement to a particular satellite. However, I may know that 
um, this satellite, for example, should be higher than this one. So I may know that satellite A should be higher than satellite B, so if I have measurements which show one satellite being higher than the other, that helps me in the, in the association problem. Okay, so ODTK is, stands for Orbit Determination Toolkit, and it's AGI's technology that we use for doing uh, satellite orbit determination. Uh, and it's basically a, a desktop application with all the typical desktop application features, right? We have embedded graphing, plotting, uh, reports, a GUI, and all that kind of stuff that makes it e an easy to use tool. It, and combined with a bunch of fairly sophisticated simulation and estimation technology. So some of the benefits of ODTK, of course, are the ability to process s multiple satellites simultaneously, hence the, the point of this talk. Um, also, the ability to process through thrusting intervals, and this, of course, is also important for formations of satellites, because uh, you do a lot of uh, formation maintenance, typically, if the satellites are, are nearby one another. Um, the ability to produce realistic covariance is also extremely important uh, because many of the applications which uh, benefit from simultaneous orbit determination are really, really, really motivated by the need for realistic covariance. Um, previously mentioned the, a specific case of probability of collision computation and how important the uh, relative uncertainty information is for that particular application. So the way that ODTK works to, um, to do the simultaneous orbit determination is we use a real-time common filter. So a common filter is an estimation technology which processes measurements individually forward in time. So at any point in time we have uh, information in the satellite estimates that corresponds to all measurements taken prior to that time. Um, and then along with the uh, orbit estimate, we generate an estimate of the orbit error uncertainty as well. Um, we can, in addition to having the individual satellite's orbit error uncertainty, we can also extract relative orbit error uncertainty when we perform uh, multi-satellite uh, orbit determination, and that's what's of, of particular interest in a lot of these problems. Um, and of course, we also have the ability to process the type of relative measurements that I mentioned uh, on the prior slide. So what's special about um, uh, relative error covariance in respect to multi-satellite orbit determination? Um, if, for example, one were to take two satellites and perform their orbit determination independently, one would get a state and state error covariance for each satellite individually. Uh, wh when one wanted to then use those, those states and state error covariance to produce relative position information and position error covariance information, what, what one would do is take the um, the error covariance from satellite one, the error covariance from satellite two, and add them. And that would be the, uh, that would statistically give you the uncertainty on the relative position, right? Because we're saying that, and basically what we're saying there is that the error covariance or the solution from one satellite is completely independent of the other satellite. When we have multiple satellite orbit determination, we do things a little bit differently, and we end up with a covariance matrix that looks like this. So uh, all covariance matrices are positive definite square matrices. And in this representation, what I have here, P11, would represent the error covariance matrix associated with satellite one, and P22 would represent the error covariance matrix associated with satellite two. Now, in the example that I just talked about, where we did the estimation independently, the way we would produce the um, relative error covariance is by adding P11 and P22 together. Okay. However, in this case, when I'm doing them simultaneously, I have additional information. The additional information I have is given up here in P12 and down here in P21, and these are the cross covariance matrices between the estimates of the two satellites. So, Whereas the, the individual absolute error covariances add when we build a relative covariance, 
the uh, cross covariance subtracts. So we, we add this to this, and then we subtract the two cross correlation terms. And that's where we get our real power of um, producing uh, relative error information. So I'm going to walk through a quick example here. Um, and the example um, is set up such that we have a target satellite flying in a circular geostationary orbit. And then we have a proximity operations satellite, which is going to fly up to our target satellite and do a, a circumnav uh, orbit about the target satellite. The proximity operations satellite has a GPS receiver on board, and that GPS receiver is going to be processing uh, pseudo range measurements. Um, and it, at the same time, the proximity operations satellite is going to use its optical instrument to track the target satellite. The only tracking that we're going to have on the target satellite is this uh, satellite to satellite optical. Okay. So this is uh, uh, just a screenshot of ODTK. And over here on this side, what we see um, is we see uh, the green line at the top, which is showing the times when the GPS um, pseudo range observations are available for our proximity operation satellite. So since we're at GEO, we're actually above the GPS satellites. So we're not seeing the, the normal um, broadcast signal of the GPS satellites going down. What we're seeing is we're seeing broadcast signals that are leaking over the uh, limb of the Earth from the other side. Right? So we don't have continuous uh, observations the way we would on a LEO spacecraft, which is under the GPS constellation. But we still have observations a good bit of the time and those observation periods are what are depicted by the green line on the top here. The blue and red lines on the bottom indicate when we have our relative optical measurements. And so that's all the time because we're flying between you know, 500 and 1,000 uh, meters away from our other satellites. So we're, we're very close to it. We can always see it. Now, this, this chart shows us um, the processing of our simulated measurements in ODTK. And up on the top, I have two residual ratio charts. Residual ratios are simply we take our, our measurement residual, which is the difference between the actual observation and what we predicted it to be, and we divide that by the expected uncertainty in the observation. That gives us a dimensionless quantity, which at the 99th percentile level, we expect to be between plus and minus 3. These charts, uh, the, the left-hand chart is showing the processing of the GPS measurements, and the right-hand chart is showing us the processing of the relative optical. Um, this, they, but they both are just basically showing that everything went fine, everything went well, which is what we would expect, certainly, because this is simulated data. Um, the charts on the bottom are showing us the covariance response of the filter to the processing of the measurements shown up above. So the chart on the left is our proximity operations satellite. And what we're seeing is we see initial um, significant uncertainty up around the 500 meter level. But it very, very quickly drops off to down in the tens of meters uh, type uh, uncertainty. And that's at a 95 percentile level. And then the chart on the right here is showing the uncertainty in our uh, target satellite which, remember, is only being tracked by the relative optical measurements. And we see that the, the uncertainties here are much larger on the order of a couple hundred meters. OK. And both of these uncertainties, I should mention, are absolute uncertainties. So they're being measured in absolute inertial space. So what we have here is a graphical depiction of this particular scenario. We have our target satellite in the middle with its initial error covariance shown as the magenta ellipsoid. And then our proximity operation satellite, which is flying the circumnav up here in the cyan, and of course its uh, initial uh, uncertainty. Both uncertainties, again, being uh, depicted in absolute uh, inertial space. As the, as the uh, scenario plays forward, what we see is during the processing of observations, the collapse of the uh, error covariance uh, representations for both satellites. Um, and interestingly, we can note that the, with the target satellite, 
that the major axis of the positional uncertainty is basically always pointed directly at our uh, proximity operations satellite. And this is due to the fact that the proximity operations satellite has an optical sensor which is sensing it's in something equivalent to up and down and left and right, but not sensing in a range direction. So it doesn't have any direct sensing along the line between the two satellites. So that's what is driving that uh, particular shape of the error covariance. Okay, so as I mentioned, that was in absolute space, but now let's talk about uh, relative space. This, this video is going to zoom, uh, well, depicts us zooming in on the target satellite, right, which was the magenta ellipse on the, the prior um, slide, and uh, we're going to see three different representations of the error covariance now. We have the magenta, which is the uh, filter output for the absolute error covariance, the exact same thing that we saw in the prior slide. We also have a blue representation, which is coming off of the smoother in ODTK. I mentioned that the filter processes information forward in time, and an estimate at any particular time contains all information from the past. The smoother pushes information from the future back into the past, so the blue ellipse um, in this case is showing a, represent a representation indicating all future data that's been processed as well. Since we have additional information in this estimate, it, the uh, error covariance is smaller than what was in the filter. But again, the blue is relative to inertial space. The yellow ellipsoid here is actually the relative error covariance. So this is the case where we have added the, the error covariance from the target to the error covariance of the proximity operation satellite, but then subtracted out the correlations. Okay, so the subtraction of those correlations is what results in this being a much, much smaller uh, ellipsoid. And as we play this forward in time, um, and I'm sorry about the jumping around, we're locked onto one particular estimate here, and we ha have multiple estimates on the screen, but you can see that the, um, the, the behavior of the relative uh, covariance ellipsoid is that not only is it smaller than the, uh, the um, ellipsoids in inertial space, but it also has a different behavior. Okay, so the important point of all this is, um, for example, if you wanted to use this information for either uh, very close formation flying or for um, probability of collision type analysis, the smaller ellipsoid in this case, of course, is what you would want to use to, to reflect the, uh, you know, a, a more or a better representation of the relative error between the two objects because that's what's really of interest. Okay, so I hope you enjoyed this presentation. Um, for more information, we had a couple of other talks uh, from the Space and Defense Expo that are uh, have, have um, complementary information in them. There's a, a talk on proximity operations and another one uh, on uh, the generation of um, uh, ephemeris and tracking data for test exercises. So once again, I'm Dr. Jim Woodburn from Analytical Graphics, and thank you very much.